There is none among us that cannot say we struggle and fail, we falter. But we know that the Lord is faithful who has promised that He'll never leave us, He'll never forsake us. He'll be right with us in all things. I want you to turn to the book of Galatians tonight because there's a question that is asked in uh, the 30th verse of the 4th chapter that we're going to deal with, but we have to back up and really read in verses 21 through 31 of the book of Galatians chapter 4, the question uh, that is asked in the 30th verse says, Nevertheless, what do the Scriptures say? What saith the Scriptures? What a targeted truth that God gives to us in this passage because if you know anything about the book of Galatians, you know that there was a war going on. There were those at Galatia who believed that everything was all of grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There was another section in that church at Galatia who thought that the law was everything. That you had to follow the law precept upon precept and line upon line. That you could not uh, in one iota vary from the law. You had to keep all the feast days and all of the rituals and all of the traditions and all that in order to be saved. If you didn't keep all those things and you weren't saved, you had to follow everything as guided under the law and by the truth of the law. Paul would bring to summation in a statement in Galatians with one verse that we read many times. He said, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Paul said, It's not of the law. It is of the cross and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so throughout the book of Galatians, he is writing to dispel the idea that the only way you can be saved is to keep all the law and and to follow all the rituals and to follow all the feasts and to follow all those things that are listed in the Old Testament. And he said, I want you to know it is of the grace of God. So Paul is trying to drive home the point that it is not law or legalism, it is the grace of God that should affect our attitude our affection, our actions as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he wants us to clearly understand the difference of living under the law and living under grace. Well, let's stand out of respect to God's Word. We read in Galatians chapter 4, we're going to begin reading in verse 21. Tell me, you that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons the one by a bondmaid and the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman by promise, which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth a bondage, which is Agar, or as we see in the Old Testament, Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in the bondage with her children. <clears throat> but Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, but thou travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than he which hath an husband. She which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as then he was born after the flesh and persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the Scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Father, bless your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. What Paul is talking about as he writes this letter to the church at Galatia is the fact that many people are hung up on the law and on following procedure 
of feast days and worship days and Jewish law, and they don't understand what it is to be free in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. They don't understand what it is to really worship. They don't know anything about worship. They just try to follow all the precepts and line upon line and all the ritual and all the law. They don't know anything about worship. They can't, they can't follow worship because they are always bound up in trying to follow some principle or some law or some legalism that keeps them bound down and prevents them from really worshiping the Lord. The Bible says that when you know the Lord, you will be free, and you will be free what? Indeed. So one of the things that he's asking the church at Galatia, he says, how much freedom do you have, and how much freedom do you feel, and how much freedom is there in your worship? Well, that needs to be asked to us as a church, to us as individuals, just like it did to the church at Galatia. We can get bound down with all these other things and miss what it is to be free. And so Paul is giving an illustration. First of all, there's an Old Testament illustration in verses 21 down through verse 31. An Old Testament illustration. Notice it very carefully when you go back to verses 21 and 22. He said, tell me you that desire to be in the law, do you not hear the law? In other words, do you follow every precept of the law? Do you keep everything to the crossing of the T and the dotting of the I? Do you keep everything like it is? And and do you worry yourself sick thinking that you're going to mess up and you're going to fall short and you aren't going to make it and you aren't going to be good enough? Most of the people in Bible-believing fundamental churches of the day and age in which we live are scared to death that they're going to mess up and that God's going to boot them out somewhere. And they're so afraid that, that because of their behavior, it's going to affect God's attitude toward them. Well, listen, if you're sincere in seeking after the face of God, it is not God's behavior that you've got to be concerned with. It is your willingness to obey the will of the Lord in your heart and your life, to walk in grace and in truth. <clears throat> now, first of all, he gives us the illustration of Hagar. He talks about what it's like to live under the law, under the principles of the Old Testament law, and yet Jesus said that he came to fulfill the law. Amen? He did not do away with the law. He fulfilled it so that we're not saved by the law, but we're saved by grace. And we don't live by the law. We live by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is within our hearts and within our life. He said, now look at Hagar. First of all, she was a slave. She was a slave. You look down there, tell me you desire to hear the law, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the slave. Now he said, if you're going to get hung up in the law, you're going to be a slave to the law. The law is going to control you, and everything that you do, you're going to be looking over your shoulder. I feel sorry for people who think that you can get saved today and lost tomorrow. Because they're always wondering if I've done something that now I'm not going to go to heaven. Let me tell you, friends, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're just as sure for heaven as if you're already there. You don't have to sit around and worry about can I, will I, may I. The truth is that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. But you see, as a slave to the law, you're burdened down with what people think and you're burdened down with how people feel and you're burdened down with the reaction. That's why some folks, you know what, some folks can't even say amen in church because they're afraid somebody's going to look at them when they say amen. Or they can't say praise the Lord or hallelujah because they think, oh man, you know, they'll think I'm a charismatic. I, I got amazed. One time I was in a revival and I, I told a fellow, I said in the, in the church, you know, I said, here I am preaching I don't get a single amen. And uh, so I, <laughs> one night during the service, I just run down, sit in the pew right there, and I said, hey, amen. Come back up in the pulpit. And the preacher, I noticed he was kind of pale when I did that, and he looked a little afraid. And so after I said, brother, did I do something to offend you? He said, no, but he said, I've told people not to be saying amen and praise the Lord and hallelujah because everybody would think we were charismatic. I said, I've been with you four days. I don't think there's a danger of that. You see, the truth is that we must be free in our worship of the Lord. Amen. 
If we're not free, then we become a slave to what other people think. We become a slave to legislation. We become a slave to the legalism. We become a slave to the law. And we can't worship in the Spirit of God. And it says here that Hagar was a slave. Her marriage to Abraham was fleshly directed. You remember how that happened? Sarah, who got off the beam, who literally was backslidden against God, arranged for for Abraham and Hagar to come together in order that he might have a, a child to be his heir. Totally against the will of God, totally against the design of God. And that's the way it is today in so many things that that happen, they are fleshly arrangements and not spiritually led. The minute we become so fleshly minded in our churches that we aren't spiritually led, we will never know what true free worship is all about because we've got to follow the precepts and the concepts of this or that or the other. As somebody said, the dying cry of a Southern Baptist church is, we never done it that way before. And you see here the legalism that is bound up. Her marriage was a fleshly arraignment. And there are a lot of things that happen in our churches that are all products of the flesh. They're not products of the spirit. They're products of the flesh. They're products of, well, I think this, or I think that, or I believe this, or I believe that. Look at that question again in verse 30. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Does it line up with the truth? of God's holy word. Her son Ishmael was naturally born. He was just the product of the flesh, born of the flesh, a design of the flesh, all a plot of humankind Sarah and what she decided that she wanted done. And Abraham the rest of his life would regret that act that he condescended to the will of his wife in order to appease her when it did not please God. And Ishmael, though God had made a promise to Abraham that his children would be under the protected covenant of God, and he did that. But from that day to this, we have seen the strife that has been engendered because of the will of the flesh. All of the descendants of Ishmael have become the Arab nation. All the descendants of Isaac have become the Jewish nation. And the Arab and the Jew are at war and continue to be at war and will always be at war. As the book of Genesis said, they are a wild man, the Arab, and his hand will be against every man, against his own brother, because it began with a fleshly insult to God. And we pay the price for it. Let me tell you, the decisions that we make have consequences. And when we decided to decide to, to walk in the way of the flesh or we decided to follow the legalism or, or the tenets of mankind more than what the scriptures say, then we're going to pay the price for it. And the consequences are going to be there. The other thing that he says here is that their son persecuted Isaac. When you look at verse 29, but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit. The law always persecutes those who walk out the Spirit. Always. The law always does. It always points fingers at them. Always makes fun of them. Like I told you about the little boy that walked in church. He had a cap on his head. And somebody went over there and very abruptly said to him, snatching the cap off, you shouldn't wear that in the house of God. I said, he's not wearing it in the house of God. He's wearing it on the house of God. Because the Bible said our, our houses are the temple of the Lord. Now listen to me. I think we ought to have the right decor in church. I think we ought to dress right. I think we ought to live right. I think we ought to do right. But when you make an affront to somebody who is seeking the gospel of Jesus Christ because of some legalism, then you've gone way off the beam and you are persecuting those who are trying to walk after the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ. We better be very careful of that. Very careful of that. When we look down our long pointed nose and we condemn somebody because of how they're dressed or how they act or how they look, that's not your category, my brother. That's God's category. Judge not lest you be judged with the same judgment wherewith you're judged. And allow God to make the call. Sure, we got standards. Sure, 
We ought to have standards. Sure, we ought to walk in the precepts of God. But what does the scripture say? What does the scripture say? You remember that woman taken in the very act of adultery and thrown down at the feet of Jesus? You remember what Jesus said to her as they all stood there with the stones in their hand? He said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Legalism is always accusative. It's always persecuting. It's always finding fault. It's always picking wrong. It's always punching around those who are trying to live by the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, her child was not considered Abraham's rightful heir. The law is not the rightful heir of the grace of God. No, grace is that provided by God, whereby we're saved through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Bible says in verse 25 that she corresponds to the earthly Jerusalem to that Jerusalem today that is divided up in three or four different ways, to that Jerusalem today that has a gold dome on it that is the, is the home of an Islamic mosque. And, uh, and uh, I, I was amazed the other, other night over at the WMU meeting when the, when the man stood up there and said that gold dome was not a mosque. It is a mosque. It's a mosque of Omar. I've stood right there at it. I've looked at it. I've seen it. I've been inside of it. It is a mosque of Omar. But that moss surrounds the dome of Mount Moriah where Abraham took Isaac to sacrifice him. And Abraham is precious to the Islamic people. They think that he is the father of the Arab nation. And the Jews say he is the father of the Jewish nation. Indeed, both are right. But one is legalistic and the other one is by the grace of God. But then there's also the allegory of Sarah. Sarah is the allegory of grace. Hagar is the allegory of the law. She was a free woman. It was God's design for Sarah and Abraham to be together. Her marriage to Abraham was spirit directed, not fleshly directed. It was by the will and the design of God. Her son Isaac was supernaturally born. You say, is that true? Yeah. Abraham was 100 years old. She was 90 years old. That's a supernatural act of God. Amen. I've told you before, how many of y'all, <laughs> my goodness gracious, like that lady, 80 years old, comes screaming out of the doctor's office and they said, what's the matter her? I said, I told you she's going to have a baby. They said, you didn't tell her that. I said, yeah, cured her of the hiccups. <laughs> it's a phenomenon, a supernatural happening by the act and the power of Almighty God. Isn't that what salvation is? Salvation is a supernatural act. It's nothing that you do. You don't get saved on your own by yourself. You get saved by the work of the grace of God because the Bible said we have not chosen Him, but He has chosen us and that we come to Him and by the supernatural power of God we are saved and made a new creature in Christ Jesus. I'm not saved by learning the Ten Commandments. I'm not saved by following the catechism of the church. I'm not saved by following the ritual of man. I'm saved by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is a supernatural act of God. But if you're supernaturally saved by the Spirit of God, then you can, be, you can expect to be plagued by the world's legalist. Because they're going to tell you all the things you don't have, you should have, and what you ought to do that you don't do, and the way that you ought to act that you don't act, be what you ought to be. Listen. <clears throat> A child of God seeks to please his heavenly father. And as we do that, as we seek after God, the thing, listen, Jesus said, I want you to understand, blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake, blessed are ye. So we who are spiritually born from above by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, when people criticize us, just get ready, you're going to get a blessing, Amen. And God's blessing is going to be upon you. Sarah represents the new covenant. It's the new promise of God. It is the plan of God for our lives. She corresponds to the heavenly Jerusalem in verse 26. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Jerusalem is where Christ died for our sins. Jerusalem is where Jesus ascended to heaven. 
Jerusalem is where the Bible says that Jesus, in like manner as you've seen him going to heaven, so shall he come from heaven. He's going to come back. Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Our Jerusalem is a Jerusalem of the freedom of the Spirit of God whereby we are saved by the blood of Jesus. Well, that's the Old Testament allegory. But there's New Testament truth. If you look the second part of the outline, really that should be chapter 4, not chapter 5. Chapter 4, verses 28 through verse 31. Look at it carefully. Now we, brethren... As Isaac was, are the children of promise. You and I, the children of divine promise of God. You're a child of a promise, aren't you? The Bible said, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a promise. When you ask the Lord to save, you did. We're children of promise. That if we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, and we believe, that he died for our sins upon the cross of Calvary, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a promise. We're children of promise. That's a promise that says, if I go away, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's a promise. We're children of the promise. The Bible says that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet, God shall sound. The dead in Christ shall rise first. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's a promise. Promise. We are children of promise, of the promise of the living God. We're protected from legalism because we're children of the promise. You know why we're protected from legalism? Because there's not a one of us in this room who has the ability to live by the law. Not a one of us. I don't care. You know... As great as you are, you can't live by the law because you're going to mess up somewhere. We're going to mess up somewhere. We're going to make a mistake somewhere. We're going to fall for somewhere. For the Bible says that we all sin and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says he that saith he hath no sin is a liar. You can't live without sin. I can't live without sin. I sin every day that I live and every day. I must come in repentance and contrition before God and ask Him for forgiveness that the blood of Jesus would cleanse me from all unrighteousness because we all sin. But we're children of the promise. And the great promise is that if we will confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a promise. That's a promise that God has given. So we are children of promise, not legalism. We are protected from the misery of the law. Look at verses 29 and 30. But as then we were born after the flesh, persecuted him, was born after the Spirit. And when they persecute you, man, you're free from the misery of that because in your heart, even though it may sting, even though it may hurt, you can say, Lord, I know there's a blessing coming because you said, I am blessed when men shall say all manner of evil against me falsely for your name's sake. And Lord, I just rejoice to know that promise is mine. We're protected from the misery of the law. Cast out the bondwoman or son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be here with the son of the free. In other words, you can't live legalistically and live by grace at the same time. You can't do it. You cannot do it. It is impossible. You cannot do it. If your salvation is dependent upon how you live, then you have no salvation. Your salvation is dependent upon what Jesus Christ did on the cross, and when he died on that cross and you received him as your Savior, then you will live to the best of your ability. As Paul said, I press on toward the prize of the mark of the high calling of Christ Jesus. Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are true, whatever things, all these things are the things that I want. But he said, do I always do them? No. I fall short. But I have the grace of God that is sufficient in my heart and my life. Because just as I am, I can come to him and know that there is salvation in none other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. 
You see, some people think if you don't do things a certain way, the roof's going to fall in. No. Listen, the roof may fall in, but God will give His angels charge over you lest you dash your foot against a stone. And you can walk in the freedom of His glorious light because we are products of grace. Look at verse 31. So then, brethren, we're not children of the slave woman, the bond woman, but we're children of the free. Now let me tell you what, you will never enjoy your relationship with Jesus Christ until you realize what it is to be truly free. To really be free. To enjoy the blessings of Almighty God. If you're always in a quandary, always with a Damocles sword over your head, always walking around, no, you can't enjoy your Christian faith. But boy, when you're made free indeed, realize Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. It's not what I do. It's not even what I understand. It's all about him and what he did on the cross of Calvary for me. And I can walk in freedom and say, Lord, I am free indeed. Because just as I am without one plea, your blood was shed for me. Though wretched, though blind, it is the love of God it reaches down to our hearts and our lives. You see, hey, I may not like the music you like. That don't make you any less saved and don't make me any less saved. We're all creatures of God. We're free in Jesus Christ. Amen. I may not like the football team you like. You may not like the one I like. That ain't got nothing to do with my salvation. If it is, then I'm walking in legalism. If I can't have fellowship with you based on the virgin birth, the sinless life, the atoning death, burial and resurrection of Jesus and the soon coming, then we have nothing to stand on. Because we're children of the free. You shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. Verse 30, nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Scripture says if you ask Jesus, He'll save you. Scripture says if you will follow Him, He will lead you. Scripture says, if you're worried, cast all your care upon Him because He cares for you. Scripture says, when you don't know the way, He is the way. You know, we get hung up on all the questions and I don't understand this and I don't know. Let me tell you folks, there's more I don't understand than I do understand. But there's one thing I know, as Paul said, I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. So, hey, it's all about Jesus where we can be free indeed. Father, speak to our hearts.